I wanted to join the Peace Corps since I was 12 uh, because I had some cousins who had been in, um, distant cousins, and it just sounded like a good idea. Uh, it sounded fun and interesting. Um, I chose Eastern Europe as my second top, uh, second to top choice uh, because I had had some experience hosting uh, little kids from Belarus through my church for a, a short-term visit to the U.S. where they stayed with us, got some medical work done sometimes, and I had learned a few phrases in Russian, so I thought that could be fun. And uh, it turns out everyone speaks Spanish and everyone learns Spanish, so Latin America was a little too uh, popular of a choice for them to put me there. Uh, and they wanted me to, speak in, uh, to teach English. So uh, Eastern Europe turned out to be the best choice. And uh, out of that, I was hoping Ukraine because I thought it would be sort of neat to learn Russian, but of course I ended up learning Ukrainian, uh, which is less of a bankable skill. Well, I knew I, I liked traveling and I knew I liked volunteering and particularly working with kids and teaching, um, which is something I'm, uh, that I've done at different times with different programs. And uh, I, I think I just, probably my reasoning was that I wanted to sort of force myself into the habit of being useful, if that's possible. And uh, it sort of is, because in Peace Corps, you really, you have no other purpose than to figure out what projects you should do, what person you should talk to, what to try next, and you're constantly talking to each other about it, and you're just kind of obsessed. Um, and it's actually much, much easier to, you know, find useful uh, things to do than when you're balancing a real job or, or something like that with the rest of your life. Um, so I, I highly recommend it. It's fulfilling. It's different. Um, I would say there's still a lot of luck associated with it in that you don't know what town you're going to be sent to, uh, what the people will be like. But if you luck out like I did, it can be a really, really great experience. I lived in a pretty small town. I would say a slightly more rural environment than a lot of the other volunteers in Ukraine lived in. Um, although I did have sort of running water <laughs> and I had electricity, uh, which not everyone has, but it, it is the norm there. And uh, a, lo a lot of volunteers end up living in cities in Ukraine because there are so many cities. And there are often older volunteers who end up going to Ukraine because uh, in terms of mobility issues or language learning uh, difficulty, it might be easier if they end up in a city where there are more people who speak English and who can help them. There's more public transportation. But uh, I was in a pretty small town, maybe several thousand people, two main roads, <laughs> And uh, there, there was, you just had to walk everywhere and there wouldn't have really been a reason to do anything else because it is pretty small. I like to think I'm smarter about some things uh, that maybe I picked up something about, you know, how different cultures are or how different people are. Um, oh, I was thinking of something. I, I, I did learn uh, to be on my own much more, um, which is definitely not going to be every Peace Corps volunteer's experience because sometimes, you know, there are some villages where you just don't have any privacy. Um, I've read a lot of essays by different volunteers from different countries, and I actually have a lot of friends who were in a lot of different countries uh, all around the world, and uh, everyone has a different experience, but then there are some uh, pretty universal things about it, and probably even if you do have very little time to yourself, you, you do... Uh, have to sort of learn to be alone as the only American or as someone who's just far from your friends and family. And I learned I was not nearly as dependent on um, having roommates or having people around as I had suspected I, I would be. Um, but, you know, at the same time, you... I, I don't know. I, I hope I learned something, but you mostly, like I said, uh, hopefully end up with people who treat you like family and who are willing to help you even though you're totally helpless and have no idea what's going on or how to speak the language, and uh, you end up with those, those ties. 
Hi there, I can relate. Uh, I started my own NGO when I was uh, just turned 23 and I moved to Vietnam and um, it'll actually be 10 years tomorrow that I've been in Vietnam so pretty exciting and as I've said to many other people it's very challenging it's been a very up and down decade you see lots of challenges and you get to have great moments as well um, and sometimes it's the very little things that you notice that are the biggest motivators working in this sector isn't always uh, how can I put it like sometimes it can be very demeaning because other people will look at you and go, like I get all the time, um, you know, oh, there's not a lot of money in that sector and, you know, why don't you get a real job <laughs> and all kinds of other negativity. And I think, you know, if I were a school teacher, you would never dare and say those things. So I do the same kind of thing. And I don't understand why people's attitudes are what they are. But anyway, uh, in terms of the other things, like when I first moved here, no one, like you never saw anybody with a cane out on the road. The only visually impaired people you'd see were at the market begging. Or, for example, there was a man with no legs. And... His wife used to go out with him and he would beg for money and after he'd give it to his wife who was wearing this, you know, these beautiful clothes, jewelry, whatever, and it was, you know, that was what you really saw of people with disabilities. And there was one student, one blind student in the whole of Hue um, who was attending university. And he was the first student to attend university. He was a law student. Now there are about 16 students who have been through and graduated from Hawaii University. You know, uh, students with visual impairments. You see the occasional person in central Vietnam going out with their white cane. And you see several in Ho Chi Minh City out and about with their canes and the people are getting more and more understanding of just how much a person with a disability can do. Uh, we do a lot of the training at Centers for the Blind. We've done classes um, online for people who can't access, you know, as long as they have a computer, you know, for people who can't access uh, a school or who can't afford classes. We make braille material and other material if there's a child with autism or, you know, some other things we try and help with that as well. We provide a lot of equipment. And, um, you know, other things as well. And last year, we began working with a school in Africa. And uh, it's in a country where there's very little, very little uh, outside support because it's a country with a lot of conflict. And even getting equipment to that school is very tricky because there's no post office that works and the only way to really do so is get um, somebody to take the equipment for us but due to conflict now that's kind of off limits as well because the people involved are being targeted and one of them I don't think is going the person who was taking the equipment 
I think is changing countries. He was uh, working for the UN. So, you know, the challenges never stop and you always have to find ways to do things that might seem impossible sometimes. You really have to put your mind to it and think. And as a foreigner, I sometimes get uh, the other thing, you know, well, you're a foreigner, blah, 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 you don't understand. And actually, I've been in Vietnam 10 years. I speak Vietnamese fluently. I know plenty of Vietnamese. I live in a very rural area, uh, you know, most of the time. So you bet I know what it's like. You bet I know what they need. And I think people assume sometimes that you don't, you know, that you don't know as much as you do. And the other thing, you know, being a very small woman who also can't see can be a huge obstacle sometimes in getting things done. Because, for example, I've been to some schools and they just don't want to listen to what I have to say, even if it's a school for the blind. Um, they don't want to, they don't want to listen. Or they just assume that I can't really do as much as I can or they don't think I can do as much as I can so you always have to work against uh, those barriers as well and you know there's so much there's so much involved in running a in running an overseas organization people don't always always uh, see the whole picture and sometimes they think you're just on a beach having fun when it's not the case at all. I think I mentioned on here earlier that I don't have a I don't have cooking facilities when I'm in Vietnam. And somebody said, "How do you how do you go about it then?" And I said, "Well, you know, for 7 years I just bought street food." You know, until I was in Europe and I could, uh, I had the opportunity to cook and I had everything that I needed to cook but you know there are several challenges you deal with and you know our power gets cut off, the internet doesn't work, the electricity gets cut off, sometimes all day. Um, when I was at the Africa Forum in Uganda in 2015 I remember the power went off one day well, a few days actually from about five in the morning until nine at night and I was staying at a guest house for the majority of the time and they wouldn't switch their generator on unless there was a football game so during the football games you you had electricity for a few hours and then they turn the generator off again so you know, and when the generator went, you had nothing. You had no, uh, no fan to keep the mosquitoes off. No, uh, no nothing. And I got really sick when I was there, and ended up in hospital. So, um, yeah, you just have a lot of challenges. But I wouldn't regret going into this field at all. You know, I've learned so much from it, and I've met so many people through doing this that I wouldn't have met otherwise. So I totally, totally found it worthwhile and I've grown as a person doing this. Hey there. Wow. Well, I am humbled by these, <laughs> these ambitious answers of, uh, of volunteering and setting up an NGO. Wow. Like that's, uh, that's very impressive. I, uh, I guess for, for me, I did the university thing, got an English degree, quickly learned that that didn't really count for much, really didn't have it in me to go for much else in terms of a, a larger degree. I, I just, I'd done four years, I was just burnt out of school, figured surely there had to be something I could do, and turned out that jobs were very hard to find, uh, even in, in a city in Canada. Uh, in central Canada, in Ontario here, in uh, Mississauga, in Toronto area. Um, so I've gradually over the years, I uh, 
yeah, I realized like I'm probably going to be on ODSP, which is social assistance uh, in Ontario. Uh, and that probably isn't going to change. It took a while for that realization to really sink in. Um, <laughs> you don't, you don't sort of automatically sort of think, oh, this is going to be my lot in life. Uh, it's a, it's a process of discovery, painful discovery often that, uh, it just you're not on anyone's radar and no one no one really has a use for you and it can be really frankly a destructive process to go through uh the only job i had uh was for about i guess 4 months ish of of full-time employment i mean and that was at a uh internet startup company that the dot com crash kind of took care of, uh, <laughs> and everyone lost their job. Uh, I had to just go back on ODSP, and and that was after two, more than two years of doing everything you're supposed to, cert, you know, sending resumes, all that kind of, you know, uh, mock interviews. I did the whole shebang, I, all the employment stuff that they put you through, the testing, the, everything. I jumped through all the hoops. So I figured, okay, this is not getting me anywhere. I can do this till I'm blue in the face and not have anything to show for it but rejection. There's got to be a better way to spending my time. And then I realized that's what I really have. I don't have a lot of money, but I have tons and tons of time. And that can be a curse as much as a blessing. Uh, people don't realize if, if they've never experienced that, that end of things, that, that kind of marginalization where you can't... I'm not good at getting around. Uh, mobility is not my strong suit. I have, well, discovered... I had sleep apnea. I, that has probably been a, plaguing my life for much longer than I really realized it was an issue. Uh, and, and hearing loss, which has also happened. Uh, so my sleep is, is completely regular. I don't know if I could have, frankly, maintained a 9-to-5 job. I, I seriously question that, <laughs> you know, these, these days. So I figured, okay, I have all this time. What do I do with it? How can I contribute? Because I have... A very supportive family. I have. I'm now that I'm in subsidized housing. Like that wait is torturous too. Waiting for that. Uh, it's you know not knowing what you can commit to. Because I wanted to volunteer, but everyone wanted a longer commitment than I could really give. Not knowing when the opportunity might come up, and I I couldn't be unavailable to take a, you know a spot because it, it, this is the waiting list is so long that it discourages you from doing anything that might get you off of it. If you know, if if that opportunity should come up and you're not ready to to get it, uh, people don't leave subsidized housing unless they, frankly, die most of the time. So, yeah, uh, the waiting list is like ten years in a lot of places, five at a minimum. So, yeah, you don't want to rock the boat. You want to be real careful. I thought, okay, what can I do? And I decided. Uh, that I had to find ways of of really going about contributing. I continued a magazine I'd started in university called Odyssey, all about accessible games for the blind, and uh, continued to do that. I uh, would volunteer wherever the opportunity came up. Uh, did a lot of stuff online, helping people, and kind of quickly discovered that that was where my strength really lay. I I did volunteer at the DAM, uh, which is an organization for troubled teens, and uh, found I, I really didn't, I wasn't a good fit there. Like, I I did my two years there as as they wanted, but I, I found, if anything, I was helping the volunteers, like talking with them about issues and helping them sort out life difficulties more than the kids I was supposed to be helping. So, it was... Uh, it was kind of frustrating. Like it, it's ri- if you can't get around that easily, no one will fund you getting to places, and you're stuck in this, <laughs> this situation where it's hard to find a place. Like I would have cheerfully done, you know, a call center work, you know, but uh, there was, you know, the, there was no way to sort of guarantee get me there and back on a regular basis. Uh, I think a lot of people are sort of stuck in that kind of situation, so. I find ways of using my writing skills to help people with mostly technology stuff. I did a guide called Personal Power, all about uh, how to use accessible computers and the internet to enrich your personal life. And now I'm doing one on uh, a version of that for iOS and how to use these iDevices. 
which offer a, a lot of advantages. Uh, and what I'm finding is is that people get them and they don't realize. No one tells them about voiceover. No one explains all the different things you can do. And history is kind of repeating itself. Uh, people get these wonderful machines and then walk around using maybe a, a small fraction of what they could to enrich their lives. So I'm writing a guide that will teach uh, and explain and be that kind of a cross between a manual and a personal friend, an excited personal friend who's made some wonderful discoveries and wants to share that with you. That is the kind of thing that I think a lot of people need to really make the transition to a flat screen device that is nonetheless accessible and use it well and really have an inkling of what they can do with it. I, I couldn't believe the level of ignorance of you know, people that have these devices and just didn't know. They thought Siri was what made these things accessible. And so I have set out to write this guide, which will really expose them to a wide, as wide a range as I can of possibilities of what they can do, what it, how it might allow them to pursue their own interests. And that's my latest challenge. I'm hoping to finish the guide uh, in about a year and a bit, um, maybe a year and a half, uh, I got a friend who's actually volunteered to narrate the thing, so that's great. I'm going to try and make it into a daisy book and get more people to publish it because uh, it's it, it the last guide I did really, it spread all over the place on the on email and internet and helped people who sort of already knew the basics but wanted to learn more, which was great, but not the the completely new people to the digital realm that I wanted to help. So I'm hoping to do better this time. Uh, in terms of getting it out there to the people who I think really need it, uh, which is going to be tricky. I'm going to approach Apple. I'm going to approach uh, different places when I have more of it done and to see if I can get some help doing that, getting it out to people. But now, right now, it's it's doing the guide that's the challenge and figuring out how to explain what is often very obvious to me, uh, trying to see that with fresh perspective and you know, put myself in that realm. And uh, in the meantime, I'm, I'm sort of helping beginners and, and doing things at, at the same time to sort of get that perspective and, and uh, help me write the guide better. So I'm doing a segment on AMI audio at ami.ca on a show called Kelly and Company on Thursdays at 4.15. Uh, the show is 3 to 5 Eastern. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a good spot where I can uh, I sort of give little lectures on iOS. We have discussions on iOS and uh, entertainment that you can find out there, podcasts, audio dramas, all that stuff. So pretty wide brief, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's keeping me in in trim and and exposing me to some thankfully good feedback so far. And uh, one of the, the things I'm doing to sort of keep aware of what's happening and and write the guide better. Done. Button.